is private equity impacting food costs? Hello, this is Jonathan Mays, Editor-in-Chief of Restaurant Business, and in this week's episode of A Deeper Dive, I speak with John Davey, the CEO and owner of Buyer's Edge Platform. Buyer's Edge and Consolidated Concepts is a digital procurement platform that helps restaurants use data and other tools to source food and other supplies. As much as the restaurant industry focuses on front-of-house technology like mobile ordering and kiosks, back-of-house technology is also important, particularly with food and labor costs increasing the way they are. We talk about that inflation and why John believes that pre-pandemic food cost inflation levels are not returning anytime soon. Hint. It has something to do with the ownership of the vendors that produce the food and their need for profit margins. We talk about how long that rate of inflation could last and what operators can do to offset it after three years of trying to find money where they haven't been able to find it before. We're talking food costs on a deeper dive, so please check it out. Okay, I'm here with John Davey. John, welcome to the podcast. Hello, how are you? Thanks for having me. Good, good. So uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Consolidated Concepts. So Consolidated Concepts is, uh, is a key division of the Buyer's Edge platform. We focus on uh, multi-unit and emerging uh, chains that uh, we help them with everything from uh, procurement, group purchasing, leveraging their buying power, along with almost a thousand different uh, chain operators to negotiate better contract pricing, rebates, and leveraging data and analytics to provide them all kinds of software tools uh, to run their business you know, smarter and more profitable. Mm -hmm. How's uh, how's demand been the last couple of years? I suspect you've had quite a bit of it. Yeah, yeah. The uh, you know the supply chain crisis and everything is really uh, you know created a spotlight on the supply chain you know departments, and there's been uh, a lot more openness to outsource different parts of their procurement supply chain. Uh, to to people as um, you know leverage our expertise so so our divisions and uh, units that focus on multi units and helping them source better uh, have really had a lot of growth in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. So how does it? Uh, I mean, how does it help? I mean, what does it do to actually help uh, small, particularly small multi smaller multi unit operators? What does that? Yeah. How does that help? Yeah, so, so an emerging chain that you know doesn't have a fully scaled out uh, procurement department, uh, maybe has you know in the tens of millions of buying power, maybe a hundred million of buying power, but certainly not say hundreds or a billion of buying power, is going to naturally just be at a at a disadvantage to you know mega chains that that have billions in buying power. So stuff. So the first most obvious thing is is they're going to get the benefit of our over twenty five billion of leveraged uh, buying power to tap into contracts that uh, they just wouldn't be able to obtain on their own. Even though they might say buy a lot of uh, napkins on their own, it's, it's not gonna be anywhere near what we can buy, you know, as a group uh, of almost 200,000 locations under the Buyer's Edge platform. So that's the big one is just immediate access to contracts that are, you know, through our leveraged uh, buying power that's gonna yield a better invoice price. And it's also gonna get them a quarterly rebate check uh, back and there's no cost to that that uh, you know emerging chain uh, for accessing that pricing and rebates, and then on top of it, they're going to get you know a, a team of people that can give them uh, consultation on on if they're trying to source an LTO or they're looking for unique products or they're having a certain supply chain disruption. You know they're going to have a team of people to lean on uh, to to help them navigate through that. And if they really need a, a lot of hands on and they want to you have maybe one person in the supply chain or, or lose a person in the supply chain. We have a whole team that can really be dedicated to them to uh, almost act as an extension of, of their procurement department. And even that we do in a way that that, that doesn't have to be a you know, monthly retainer. Uh, we generally get paid from the vendors. So this ends up being a, a, a neutral for their P&L. So it's not a negative expense to us on their P&L. And oftentimes we're really sending them rebates back so that we're really a positive impact on their on their PL. Mm -hmm. So where are so last couple of years uh we saw some pretty uh generationally high inflation. Yeah. Um uh pretty serious. Where where is that at right now? What do you see happening in 2024? Yeah, I think it's uh <clears throat> it's definitely already started to normalize. I mean, there was uh there was there was not just, you know. I mean, the food prices, I mean, you know, distributors weren't able to find drivers. They were paying mm -hmm. 
their drivers, you know, exorbitant pay and, and uh, not even be able to, you know, recruit enough drivers, which of course impacted uh, costs. Uh, so I think we're going to continue to see prices. They've already come down, you know, quite a bit. And I think we're going to continue to see, uh, you know, prices come back to, you know, normalized levels, but it's, it's not going to, I don't think it ever is going to go back, you know, to, you know, mm-hmm sort of pre-COVID prices, I think we're going to, we're going to still be uh, stuck a bit higher, um, but, but not, not, uh, the, you know, the craziness of, of a year ago. So I think it's going to be more normalized, but I think operators are going to really still have to, uh, you know, adjust prices for kind of a, a new normalized, you know, higher, higher cost base. Do you think, you mean like food cost inflation is going to, to be higher than pre-pandemic going forward? You don't, you don't, oh, yeah. going back to, to pre-pandemic, what, what, what leads you to believe that? Well, I think that uh, anytime vendors, uh, you know, get a taste of a, a new higher price point and 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 margin level, they 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 get stuck in that with their investors and and especially you got private equity investors owning manufacturers and distributors and or publicly traded companies and uh, you know they've enjoyed they, the vendors in general have enjoyed a higher uh, profit margin over mm-hmm. the, with with these spikes in supply chain. And they're going to give some of that back because they're just going to have to through natural competition. And uh, when they co- kind of take their focus back to growing top line revenue, you know, they're going to have to cut their margins a bit back to normal. But I don't think they're going to go back to where they were. So it's going to be it's kind of like a quick to rise and slow, slow, you know, to fall. And I just don't think that um, they're going to come down to it to where they were. So I think. You know, hmm. over the long run, you're just you're just naturally going to see you know overall you know you know food inflation uh, happen. But but particularly now, I don't think the 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 vendor community is going to going to allow the the, the kind of crazy low low margin business that they used to they used to put up with. Hmm. So so they they tolerated a lower margin before the pandemic because they were concerned about losing business from from restaurants, but they seem to be less concerned about that. Then. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's been a whole mindset shift where, you know, before the pandemic, it was all about top line growth and uh, it was OK. You know, they put up with some low margin chain business, let's say, just to have the top line revenue to fill slots, fill the warehouse, keep the trucks moving. And that's kind of how they could justify very low cost plus uh, markups. Mm-hmm. And then with the supply chain crunch, they they disbanded a lot of that business. They they terminated and gave up customers that, that were those low margin business. And I don't, I, I think they're going to keep a more profit margin mind and not only on top line growth. So they're just going to, they're not going to agree to those uh, lower markups that they may be used to. And they're, and, 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 and it just seems like everybody's running more like at capacity and you, you don't hear is often oh we have tons of capacity we can and then they start discounting heavily and, and so i don't think they're going to go back to that at least not for a long time are they going to get back to that kind of cutthroat where they're yeah. you know, they'll, they'll, they'll compete with each other to, for for low margin business don't you think though i mean to say one of my concerns or at least one of the issues that we've seen is that you know restaurants were able to have been able to price aggressively to offset those costs you know, and for the most part, with some exceptions, for the most part, consumers have been willing to pay it. You know, now low income right. consumers not. But right. on balance, you know, restaurant sales are still generally going up. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are not, you know, they're not really, you know, they might be losing traffic, uh, but they're sort of chalking it up to losing low income consumers. And for the most part, their sales are still going up, which on balance, I mean, I I think if you, you know, a lot of operators actually would be perfectly willing to have a smaller number of customers who are willing to pay a higher price because then their own, it makes their lives easier. Yeah. My concern, and I think that if you talk to roughly 100% operators, at some point this is going to stop. At some point, the consumer is going to say, that's no no more. And doesn't at that point then, if we get to that particular point, that isn't going to put some pressure on the supplier community to say, all right, that's it. We got to we got to start pricing lower because we're going to lose this business from restaurants because they're really going to put pressure on us to, to lower. Yeah. 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 And I'm definitely not a uh, kind of a consumer uh, expert on that trend, but I I agree in general that, um, 
you know, it's some, there's, there's some price level that, that you really, they really start losing customers and that will downstream impact, um, you know, the vendors. So, yeah. So I think they're, you know, it's sort of like if, if prices went up 50% and they come down 25, I feel like we're at a point now where like everybody's pretty happy. They got their back down a bit, but the vendors are still sitting at a, at a pretty nice level compared to where, where they used to be. Mm -hmm. And, uh, how long you know that's sustainable i'm not i'm not quite sure but it's just this it's simple supply and demand i mean i think we'll have we'd have to see a pretty big shock to, to consumer demand i think to to see a really meaningful drop in in supplier pricing really yeah, yeah. so how does all right so you now like from my understand so my uh understanding is you know or at least my uh, belief roughly similar is that labor costs are probably going to be uh, going up roughly at higher the rate than they did as before the pandemic. So like, yep. um, uh, although it's in, important to remember before the pandemic, we had a labor shortage in the restaurant industry and, and wages were going up before the pandemic. Yeah. But my guess is that so that's one of the things we're probably in a roughly tightish labor market going forward, absent what you're saying is a shock. So yeah. even with lower overall inflation than we certainly saw last year and in 2022, restaurants, prime costs, food and labor are going to be going up at a roughly elevated rate. And oh, yeah. particularly if you're a place like California, now you're facing a 30 percent dramatic dramatic 30 percent increase in, in labor costs yeah. will not come with the ancillary benefit of sales because only fast food restaurants are going to have to pay that wage. Mm -hmm. But so how does a restaurant company, particularly a smaller one, the companies that you deal with, how do they offset these cost increases? What can they do? to keep their supply chain costs lower. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's where, uh, <clears throat> you know, technology is a way to really do more with less. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of great technology companies where we have, a we've acquired, you know, a lot of technologies and built a lot of our own technologies. And, and that's where I think operators to, you know, try to mitigate some of that increased labor cost. They've got to really turn to data and analytics and, and technology to um, get an edge there. So they don't have to, like your point is, if labor's up 30%, then it's going to be pretty hard to just pass on 30% price increases to the consumer. Sure. You'd probably have to price on something for all that increased labor cost. But if you can you know, deploy labor scheduling uh, more efficiently and, and food cost management, you know, softwares and, uh, you know, uh, keep a better control um, you know, over your labor and better analytics and make better decisions with better data, you know, that's, that's a key way to, um, you know, mitigate that. Mm -hmm. How does it, I mean, like, how does it work to, to, you know, like, how does this technology work to lower your, or to control your, your food costs? Where are you, where are you saving your money? Yeah. So with a full food cost management system, if you're, if you're taking, you know, uh, digitizing all your purchasing data coming in, um, which we do. And then you, you leverage uh, a tool to take inventory, mm -hmm. um, not on a clipboard and, and just the good old fashioned way. You actually leverage your, your raw inputs coming in of everything you're ordering. You can take inventory a lot quicker and more accurately when you have a, you know, a tablet and, and all your live pricing is there. You take your inventory. And um, then you you feed in your your full recipes of all your all the ingredient level of every every menu item, and then you link that with your point of sale for all your your sales and revenue data. You know that's going to give you really a holistic picture of 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 your true food costs, not just what you calculated as your food cost you know three months ago, which could be totally different you know three months later, and on every single line item. And layered against, you know, your, your, the revenue on each of those items, you know, that's where you're going to start to pick out and find ways to, um, you know, save money and, uh, uh, you know, reduce costs. So you're going to be able to figure out, you know, waste and possibly theft. You're going to figure out menu items that are, are no longer, you know, hitting a, a good food cost. 
And, and so that's what we're seeing, you know, more and more operators, the larger chains have, have had, you know, some of these systems for, for a while. And mm-hmm. it's, I'm actually surprised when I see very large chains that still don't have a robust uh, food cost management system, oftentimes franchisee systems that, you know, just kind of leave it up to the franchisees to decide if they're going to deploy a food cost management software or not, which many of them, of course, don't. Um, I think you're just going to see more and more investment in, in, you know, back of the house, you know, systems to, to control and get, gain real visibility uh, to all these costs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, on, on the surface, it would surprise me that franchisees don't do this sort of thing. But uh, at the well, same time, franchisees are also very skeptical of, of the upfront investment and they want to see a payoff. They want to see yeah. a return on investment. And to get that return on investment, I think sometimes they need to see how much, you know, or, you know, they, there, there needs to be something that drives it. And, and I think the last two years, probably for your business, was probably as good as anything that you could have had because they're, you know, um, you know, there's a lot of pressure on this industry right now to find ways to make do with less, right. uh, without price. Now they're pricing very aggressively, you know, no right. matter what anybody says, fast food restaurants in particular are still pricing at well above the rate of inflation. Mm-hmm. And, um, but, you know, that still does an awful lot to get people to invest in technology, which is one of the things that we've seen over the past couple of yeah. years, more investment in technology than we've ever seen. Yeah. I mean, when you see your, if your monthly food cost is up, you know, three, four or 5,000, you know, a month, let's say it's not, not too hard to justify an investment of $150 a month to you know, four or $500 a month in a, in a real robust, you know, back of the house, you know, software system. Um, you know, when you fully deploy a back of the house inventory recipe system, you can see two to 3% reduction in your, in your food cost percentage. So going from say a 33% to a 30%. And if you're, you know, if you're a million dollar revenue restaurant, I mean, that's, you know, 30 grand is, is pretty meaningful. So it's going to be easy to justify an investment in a, uh, a system like that. It's not just the investment. You also got to be ready to, to have your team really embrace it and, uh, you know, deploy it. So it's not just the, the SaaS cost of deploying a system, which I think is probably the easier decision. 150 bucks a month, a couple hundred bucks a month shouldn't be too much of a stretch for any location doing a, you know, a million dollars or, or more. But you just got to have a good manager or team to spend the time to, to, to do it. So our big focus, especially because we do a lot of very small restaurants, single unit operators, all the way up to large, large chains. And of course, the, the emerging mid-sized chains um, is we try to make it really simple, uh, you know, make it is at least the amount of data entry as possible. And we can do that through a lot of data automation. Uh, we can train them, you know, very quickly and get the system to bring them value, you know, very fast within a, a week or two. They're already getting value out of it. Uh, even if they're not fully, you know, entrenched in the software, um, then over time they get more and more value as they get more and more inputs in, like their recipes down, maybe coming down the road, or their point of sale data coming in down the road adds even an extra levels. So I think it's a key of, of just starting with: can they justify the the couple hundred dollars a month to mm-hmm. have a back of house system? And then you know who's the person that's going to really own it at uh, each location and and do it and uh, it's gonna it's gonna pay off you know for them and they're gonna get a, a clear ROI once they're once they they've seen it up and running for a month or two. Mm-hmm. Now, are you seeing anything uh, anything you could tell me in terms of like how uh, operators are thinking? Are they in in how they're uh, what kind of uh, LTOs or what kind of things are they purchasing? Uh, we saw during the pandemic, for instance, that there was a dramatic reduction in overall menus. I think one of the low-key uh, trends that people tend to ignore is last year we saw, I think, more LTOs than we'd ever seen before. Hmm. Uh, and in you know that you know at least in terms of you know. Uh, records for for technomic. Are we seeing any any sort of shift in thinking this year in terms of how companies are are viewing LTOs or or their product mix at all? I don't have any strong uh, you know strong data that I could say mm-hmm. with a lot of conviction. But um, in general, I, I think that that LTOs are still you know going to be at least remain the same or or uh, on the upswing. I think operators you know want to keep testing and innovating, and LTOs are great great way to do that. And, um, you know, I think there is a good amount of product innovation and, and, 
and obviously the consumer trends are, are shifting all the time. So I think operators are very smart to keep trying new things through through the LTO process, but I don't have any hard data on it for this year. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they needed it. It was, you know, the LTO thing is, it was it was one of the more interesting things that came out of last year. And it was, it was largely due to, you know, restaurants needed to generate traffic right. uh, without raising, you know, without lowering prices. And that right. pressure to, and I, I don't, you know, I, I think we're seeing some deals being offered early this year, which is indicative to me of, of sort of the easing of, of, of the cost structure a little. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, for the most part, I think that there's still going to be this pressure to, to send out more LTOs because you just don't really have the pricing power that you did before the pandemic to to offer the sorts of aggressive discounts that you might have done in the past right and certainly franchisees are really not going to tolerate it right now and yeah you know we see it all over the place mm -hmm. that yeah. makes sense right right all right super well john this was fantastic i really appreciate you joining me this week on the podcast absolutely no thanks for having me and that should do it for this week's episode of A Deeper Dive, which was edited, as always, by Spoons. Artwork by Nico Hines. You may find this and other episodes of the podcast on our website at www.restaurantbusinessonline.com backslash article backslash deeper dash dive. And you may subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. I'm Jonathan Mays, your host, podcast producer, and the editor-in-chief of Restaurant Business. Thank you for listening.